Hello, gathered friends, I'm Prora Nuva, and welcome to Bionicle Deep Dive, where we analyze the tropes, characters, and lore of LEGO Bionicle. Over the past few years, there has been a general increase of activity in the Bionicle community, as well as a surprising amount of attention from LEGO themselves. And with credible sources circulating rumors about a possible commemorative Tahu set coming from LEGO this year, there are many questions on the future of Bionicle, and if there is any possibility of it returning. But with those questions also come reservations about G1 and G2's cancellations. So I thought now would be a good time to look back on what may have gone wrong in the first place. This video is going to be the first in a three-part series talking about some of the story-based reasons why Bionicle, both Generation 1 and Generation 2, have ended in the past, as well as ways they could have avoided these pitfalls in order to ultimately answer these questions. Should Bionicle come back? Can it come back? And if it does, how? Here in part one, I'm going to be looking at what I believe was a major source of trouble in Bionicle's original run, which was its difficulty attracting newer and more casual audience members due to how large and scattered much of the previous story material was. In part two, I'm going to talk about how Generation 2 had its own problems attracting an audience, and in part three, I'm going to give my conclusions on whether or not Bionicle should come back, and if it does, how to avoid the mistakes of the past. So, let's dive right into it. Now, ultimately, the reason why Bionicle ended, both in G1 and G2, was lack of toy sales. LEGO is first and foremost a toy company, and their primary business model centers around selling toys to retail stores, who then sell it to consumers. If consumers don't buy the toys from the retailers, then the retailers will stop buying them from LEGO, and LEGO will be forced to stop making that toy. It should be noted that, for Generation 1's cancellation, at the time, Bionicle wasn't actually selling poorly per se, but there had been a notable decline in sales, so they decided to pull the line while it still had a relatively decent reputation among retailers, so that if it were to ever come back, it still had a reputation of selling well. G2, on the other hand, was a different story, but we'll cover that more in Part 2. Now, I should say that there are multiple factors that may have led to Bionicle's declining sales. However, I am mainly going to be focusing on the story aspect of it. I'm not really an expert on the ins and outs of toy sales and development, or the larger market trends that shaped consumer decisions, all of which had a huge role to play. So, take what I say here with some skepticism, as I'll admit myself, it is an incomplete picture. I am, however, very good at analyzing stories, and I believe that how the story of Bionicle was handled by LEGO was a major contributing factor both in its atmospheric rise and eventual decline. While the toy sales were always the bottom line, arguably the biggest hook for the toys was the story and the world that came with them. At least that was definitely the case for me. While there are tons of casual fans who mainly just liked the toys, the people who really stuck with the series were enamored by the plot, the characters, and the rich world building. That meant when the story became less accessible to new fans, the draw to buy the toys wasn't as strong. While the fans who were already keeping up with it from the beginning loved diving into it, newer fans had more and more material to go through to catch up with what was happening now. And that's not even mentioning the dictionary's worth of specialized words for the settings, characters, and lore. Now, I'm definitely not the first person to argue that Bionicle's story being hard to catch up with was a contributing factor to its decline. Many people in the fandom have commented on this, and even members of LEGO, including Greg Farshti, have cited this as a major reason. However, most people say that it was because Bionicle's story was getting too large and complex, and I partially disagree with this. There are plenty of kids' stories that are very large and complex that managed to continue gaining new audiences. No, what I believe was the problem was not the size of the story, but the accessibility. The story was scattered across too many different mediums, and it was difficult to know where to start or how to follow. This meant it would be difficult for people who would genuinely be interested to easily catch up and get invested. This left us with a lot of casual fans who kind of knew what was happening, and a lot of fans who loved it with every fiber of their being, but not a whole lot of people in between. And even now, after it's discontinued, I can see the effects of this on the Bionicle fandom. Fact is, Bionicle has a lot of super fans who really got into the lore and read all the books and guides and serials, the obsessed fans who love it to this day. Like, <laughs> me. 
the people who go, oh my god, Monica was my entire childhood. The lore went so deep, and I remember all of it. <laughs> and, of course, Bionicle as a whole was a hugely popular toy line. Thousands of kids all over the world play with it. So you've got a lot of people who are like, oh yeah, those cool robot toys from the 2000s. I like the red one. So yeah, you've got, you know, lots of fans who liked some of the toys as a kid and thought they were cool, but didn't follow the story all that closely. These are the casual fans that made up a critically large portion of the consumer base. But they also weren't very invested, and could easily drop it off if the story became more than they were into. I believe that the distribution among fans across various levels of passion is very important to the success of a franchise. To give a comparison, let's look at Star Wars, for example, which has a very wide fandom. Star Wars has its super fans who know all the expanded universe, watched all the shows, read all the books and comics, and have encyclopedic knowledge about the lore way beyond what was just presented in the movies. And then, of course, you have the casual fans who know of it and maybe saw a little bit of Star Wars stuff, which is honestly a very wide swath of people, considering how huge Star Wars is. Almost everybody's heard of it at this point. But then you have what I like to call the medium fans, who saw the movies, maybe saw some of the TV shows, and really like Star Wars, but don't go all in on learning all the extended universe books or lore or stuff like that. They still love the series, but they don't go deep diving to the same extent. And I would say that those medium fans are probably the driving force in keeping the series going. They are invested, they want to see more, but they don't stray too far from the most accessible media. And I think that's what's critical about medium fans. They will show up, but only if the story is easy to find. And once they're in, the pipeline from medium fan to super fan isn't very hard if the story is compelling enough. I think it says a lot about Bionicle's strength as a story that when fans did get invested in the lore, they so often became super fans. So many people online talk about how once they found the story, they became enthralled and it became their childhood. Once a person has access to the story, it proved more than enough to keep them hooked and inspired. But the core superfans on their own aren't enough to keep a franchise going. There simply aren't enough of them. We needed medium fans, which we just didn't have as much. Now, they aren't very active in online spaces, but Bionicle did actually have a ton of medium fans. The fans that really liked the series, but only followed the media that was most accessible to them. You meet tons of them when you ask around. They'll often go, oh, I love those movies, oh, I remember the comics, oh, the animations were so good, but often didn't keep up with the story as a whole. So often you run into people who were essentially big fans of a small slice of Bionicle, but didn't know much of the story outside of their slice because they either didn't know of or weren't so invested that they went out of their way to look for more. They enjoyed the media they had access to most. And the scattered nature of the medium Bionicle fans is a direct result of the scattered nature of the Bionicle story. Lego got super experimental with Bionicle. This was really their first attempt at a story-based toy line. They kept trying out different forms of media and storytelling methods, which were often utilized to great effect, so I don't really blame them. But this also meant that fans had to piece together the story from multiple sources that didn't always have a clear reading order which is a lot of effort that can be daunting if you aren't already invested. The books were probably the best since they told the whole main story and are really the only single media where you can get a version of the story that's truly complete. You get the introduction of the characters and they really fleshed out the depth of the world by exploring the locations. And you also got to see into the minds of the characters themselves. They became much more introspective in the books. And that's why many of the fans who liked the books became super fans. It's possible that if the books were pushed harder by Lego, the series could have gained more traction in the young adult genre, and the depth of the story could have gained more recognition. But even still, the books really only appealed to a relatively niche group of kids. Not all children were really into reading lots of books on their own. And in any case, books are hard to make large advertisements for, especially when Lego had other focuses. But what that meant is that you had to go out of your way to find the Bionicle books. So the less dedicated fans generally followed different media that was more easily advertised. Of course, there was the material that could be found online at Bionicle.com, definitely the most accessible story content. The site provided blurbs and description of all the characters and locations, as well as animations. 
and later on, the site provided the story serials, which were hugely popular among superfans. However, the main site really just covered the basics and didn't show as much of the depth that the characters in World had. Tons of cool tidbits, which were great and offered a good sample, but the site could really only do so much on its own, and fans had to go out elsewhere for the meat of the story. And anyways, the serials followed side stories that were essentially expanded universe content that really appealed to fans who were already immersed in the universe, but the serials wouldn't really appeal to a newer fan. Now, the comics were another very accessible and very popular form of the story, and they were a fantastic overview since they covered the entire main plot from beginning to end. However, they didn't always capture the full scope and depth of the story. Not to say that the comics didn't have any of this, there were amazingly emotional moments in the comics. But they were very short format and had a lot to cover. This meant that for the most part they had to focus way more heavily on plot events and the actual depth of the story was given a little bit less focus. Especially since they had to focus less on the locations and less on the internal lives of the characters. Now, the movies were pretty accessible, and they were heavily advertised, and most kids love things they can watch. So many people loved the movies, and I know a good number of people who the movies were their main source of Bionicle. But the problem with it is that the movies were a very incomplete picture of the Bionicle world. They were great at portraying the section of the story and the characters they were about, but they lacked a lot of the additional context, and if you were to just watch all four movies with nothing else, you'd likely be a little confused by the massive gaps they leave. Especially the gaps between Mask of Light and Legends of Metsunui, and also the huge gap between, um, between Web of Shadows and um, Legend Reborn. In addition, there were tons of amazingly emotional and captivating moments in the stories that never got a movie, so movie-onlys never got to see them. But all this to say, Bionicle had so much story, but it was spread out across so many different places, it was difficult for fans who were not following it to catch up, because no single media had all the story, except for the media that was the, the least advertised. And this is a problem because when medium fans don't have their accessible media, they aren't able to contribute more to the fandom and the franchise. They can essentially be pushed into casual fan status of a story that they would legitimately enjoy because they weren't able to fully experience it. And since the stories went on for 10 years, there was so much to it, and worse, so much complex lore and terminology, that it became hard for medium fans to keep up. Now, Something that I really need to make clear, just in case any of you misinterpret me, I'm not blaming the medium fans or the casual fans for Bionicle's decline. I'm not saying that they should have been, like us, true super fans. No. Every fandom space needs its spectrum of enjoyers, and that's healthy and good. Especially given how super fans across all fandoms can get kind of uh, defensive and toxic and in their own head. It's good to have those more grounded audience members who aren't obsessed. The point isn't that the medium fans needed to get more invested. The point is that we needed more of them, and therefore we needed more opportunities for those less dedicated fans to enjoy the story, and as such, uh, get invested in the characters, and therefore, buy the toys. Now, many people, including myself, believe that Bionicle could have benefited heavily from a TV show, much like Ninjago, Ninjago enjoyed. A single, extremely wide-reaching story content could have gotten the bulk of the story into a broader audience, much like how anime typically reach wider audiences than manga, and superhero movies reach bigger audiences than their original comics. This format would also allow those fans who were introduced later a clear way to catch up, just start from episode 1. Though, it would have had to be pretty complete and good quality, not like a miniseries with mixed writing. <coughs> Journey to 1. <coughs> But we didn't get that, and despite how things ended up, I did actually love what we got. I wouldn't give up the books for anything. And But going forward, just like then, it can be difficult for new fans to know where to start, and with all the story spread out over books, comics, movies, and series and animations. This is why fan projects like Wall of History and Biological Chronicle are so hugely significant. These projects are large fan-made compilations of the entire G1 canon, all in one place, in order, with the various pieces of the story weaved together into a single cohesive narrative. 
I would go as far as to say that these types of projects have been the biggest and most important steps in keeping Bionicle alive and paving the way for new fans to join us, as now anyone who's curious about Bionicle has places they can go to just read the whole thing. And I've seen the effectiveness of it firsthand. There are several people I've met online who just got into Bionicle and went through these compilations and came out loving and appreciating the series. These projects ensure that the series has a future, regardless of whether or not LEGO picks it back up again. A future among new fans, who may appreciate looking back on those weird robot toys from the 2000s, whose lore went so deep. But that's my take on Bionicle's G1's audience problem. The series was big and complex, but more than that, it was decentralized, leading to newer fans having a harder time getting into it. What do you guys think? Do you agree with my take that what led to G1's premature ending? Or do you believe other factors may have played a bigger role? And what are your thoughts on the future of the series, given the advancements the fandom has made? Let me know in the comments, and I'll see you guys next time for my take on how G2 went down, with its failure to capture a new audience. Until then, take care, my gathered friends.